Hi, I'm Chris Tobin. I'm a Darig man and I present cultural activities and tours for the Parramatta Visitor Information Centre. A cultural partnership, you might say. This is the story of an unusual early alliance between a Burramatical man and an Englishman. George Cayley and Daniel Muwatton came from very different backgrounds, but together they comprised one of the most successful cross-cultural scientific partnerships in the colony of New South Wales. It was right here, in what is now known as Parramatta Park, that they first shared a small cottage, from where they set out for many expeditions to collect botanical specimens, which still grace the national herbariums of both Britain and Australia. Sadly, no image of either Cayley or Muwatton exists. Our only clue is from Samuel Marsden, who described Daniel as a very fine youth and a very handsome young man. George Cayley was born in 1770 in Yorkshire the son of a horse dealer. With little formal schooling, he seemed destined to work in the stables, but his curious nature and an interest in the medicinal herbs used to treat horses led him to teach himself botany. Showing initiative and the drive that would come to define him, in 1795, he wrote to Sir Joseph Banks, requesting and obtaining work as a gardener's labourer, hoping for opportunities to increase his botanical knowledge. Cayley worked in various gardens over the next few years, including the famous Kew Botanical Gardens, he must have impressed his patron as Banks appointed him as a botanical collector in New South Wales at his own expense. Cayley arrived in Sydney aboard the Speedy in 1800. Upon arriving in Parramatta, he noted, the general mode of living is very mean and wretched, many having nothing but the store allowance. Vegetables are very scarce. Governor King planned to establish a botanical garden and he wanted Cayley to contribute to its development. King granted him government rations, two convict servants, and the use of a small cottage adjacent to Government House. Cayley set about establishing his own vegetable garden, growing cabbages, potatoes, onions, watermelon, apples, figs and peaches. Though the precise location is not known, it seems from an early illustration that the nearest cottage to Government House was located just here, in what is now known as the Crescent. So this may have been the one. This is James Ruth's Agricultural High School in Carlingford. Ex-convict Richard Partridge had a 60-acre grant very close to where I'm standing in what were then known as the Northern Boundary Farms. Though his equipment was somewhat more basic than what we see today, he too would have been growing crops and raising livestock. Partridge was by this stage a constable, pound keeper and carter, who also happened to be the country's hangman and famously left-handed flogger. Daniel Muwatton was an Aboriginal man of the Darug Nation, born around 1790 to 92. He had been orphaned as an infant and was taken into the home of Richard Partridge as a companion for his young son. Samuel Marsden said Muwatton was of the Parramatta tribe, the Burramadigal, and it seems Daniel maintained strong connections to his people, including Bidji Bidji, who would later become a prominent elder in the community. Cayley was a dedicated naturalist who amply repaid Sir Joseph Banks' trust in his abilities. He set to work collecting plants, making a particular study of orchids, but his diligence and persistence in demanding the resources he needed to continue his work, including boxes in which to safely store his specimens, did not win him any friends. He complained about dairy cows trampling the governor's garden, believed also to be the site where his living plant collection was kept. His arguments with his neighbour, the prominent churchman Samuel Marsden, over Marsden's pigs repeatedly destroying his own garden, were also ongoing. Today, Cayley's demands seem quite reasonable. But by the standards of the times, he was deemed to be a pesky upstart for daring to question his social betters. Indeed, even his own patron, Banks, wrote, had he been born a gentleman, he would have been shot long ago in a duel. Cayley was also out of step with the establishment in his attitude to Aboriginal people. He wrote, it is said that the natives of New South Wales are the most idle, wretched and miserable beings in the world but I could single out several that surpassed numbers of Englishmen in mental qualifications. Though Governor King had imposed official restrictions on mixing with Aboriginal people, Cayley quickly learnt to converse in several local languages. He inquired into and valued the scientific knowledge held by Aboriginal people. 
In 1800 he wrote, I mean to get acquainted with as many of them as I can in order to learn their customs. At the age of about 10, Daniel Mawatton went to live and work with George Cayley, who at first referred to him as Dan. From adolescence, when he may have been initiated, he was more often called Mawatton, or Mawati, meaning bush path. Probably by the time Daniel joined him, Cayley had moved from his primitive cottage to the old government farm building, once located here. The house was described as a weather-boarded and shingled dwelling, having an extensive garden under cultivation. By 1805, Mwatton, being able to speak multiple Aboriginal languages and with cultural knowledge, was working as Cayley's interpreter, guide, servant and companion on expeditions around Sydney. One of Mwatton's greatest contributions to scientific knowledge was to provide Cayley with the means to begin his pioneering studies of the eucalypts. In order to classify plants, botanists needed to access their leaves, bark, fruits and flowers. With eucalypts being large trees, Cayley could not reach them. Now Mawatton, an accomplished climber of trees, assisted Cayley with accessing the necessary examples. Cayley labelled such specimens with Got by Dan. Mawatton was also able to share with Cayley the Darig names and uses for these eucalypts, along with other plants and animals unknowingly helping to preserve important elements of his culture. For example, the Sydney blue gum was called Kalangora, the black butt, Tarandaya, and the Sydney red gum, or Angophora, was Nadangora. The governor wrote to Banks that Cayley would have the use of government house at Parramatta, which was rarely occupied by the governors of the time, to dry his botanical specimens. Cayley's modest hut admitted too much wind to allow this. Cayley and Mawatton would have used a wooden plant press to aid in drying and pressing their specimens. The space in government house was possibly also used in preserving the animal specimens they had collected. In July 1805, Mawatton and Cayley went on an exploratory expedition to the cow pastures area. Then in October, they sailed aboard the ship Sydney to Norfolk Island, aiming to collect living plant and animal specimens for banks. On Norfolk Island, they collected 22 new plant species. After a few weeks, they continued to Van Diemen's Land, where they stayed until January 1806. They climbed Table Mountain, now known as Kunani, or Mount Wellington, collecting alpine plants. They also managed to catch an echidna, something that Banks had been requesting for some time. But echidnas are notoriously hard to keep hold of, and it escaped. In January 1807, another plant-collecting expedition took them north from Parramatta to the coast at Narrabeen. In addition to gathering plant specimens, Mwatton's skills as a bird and animal trapper were invaluable to Cayley. From the time Daniel joined him, Cayley started to use Darig names for animals when he described them to Banks. In July, Cayley sent Mwatton out in search of a koala to send to Banks. Cayley heard disturbing news that Mwatton had been speared in the thigh and killed. Cayley was later relieved to report to Banks that, notwithstanding this severe wound, he very soon recovered. Though the quest was not a success, Mwatton's report of a great waterfall he had found encouraged Cayley to join him on a further expedition to the Cataract River and Appen Gorge, which Cayley named Cataract of Kurangurung on the River Mwatton. The cascade I shall call Muwatan, to commemorate the memory of the native to whom I am debted, not only for the discovery of the cataract, but for causing me to undertake the journey, whereby other discoveries were made. In 1808, Cayley described Muwatan as the best interpreter of the more inland native languages than any I have met with. I can place that confidence in him which I cannot in any other. All except him are afraid to go beyond the limits of the space which they inhabit and I know this one would stand by me until I fell if attacked by strangers. Cayley later said of Aboriginal people, if they had intended me any mischief, where was there one more exposed to them? It may be asked how I gained their affections. To this I answer by never taking any advantage of them and never forfeiting my word.
In 1808, Banks released Cayley from his botanical responsibilities. Cayley had been homesick for a long time and was weary of the constant struggle to attain scientific basics. He had also for some time been requesting permission to bring Mewatton back to England with him, believing that he would benefit from some formal education. Though Banks had not responded to this request, Cayley went ahead and took Mewatton with him anyway. In 1810, Cayley, Mewatton and fellow nurseryman George Sutter boarded the Hindostan bound for England. They brought with them Cayley's pet cockatoo and a wealth of natural history specimens including 700 bird and animal skins and an array of live and preserved plants. After previous visits to England by Aboriginal and Islander people had been less than successful, it was now government policy to discourage such practice. So when they finally arrived after a difficult six month voyage, Mawatton was confined to the ship in Woolwich for the entire winter while Cayley tried to find a sponsor for his orderly conduct. Presumably, Cayley was not considered enough of a gentleman to take this responsibility. Eventually, Banks, who did not approve of the visit, relented and stood guarantor. Later, Banks, requesting a passage for Mewatton back to the colony, referred to Cayley as injudicious for having brought him to England. He was only the third Aboriginal person to set foot in Britain. George Sutter finally brought Mewatton to Cayley in January 1811. The first thing Cayley did was to have Mewatton inoculated against smallpox and he was taken to meet Sir Joseph Banks the following day. Then they visited Kew Gardens, where a cabbage tree palm specimen previously sent by Cayley was already thriving. Mewatton was also taken to meet the president of the Royal Society, explorer Matthew Flinders, and to pay visits to ex-Governor Bly and the botanist Robert Brown, both of whom he would have known from Parramatta. He lived for a year with Joseph Banks, assisting Cayley and Robert Brown with the botanical work. He even joined Cayley on at least one occasion at the court-martial of Lieutenant Colonel George Johnson for the coup against Governor Bly. While away from home, he frequented theatres and public houses and took up drinking, which led to a split with Cayley, who was so angry at this development that he assaulted Mewatton, breaking his own thumb in the process. In 1811, Mewatton, who had always maintained that the woods of his country were finer than anything England had to offer, returned to Sydney in the company of nurseryman George Sutter, but without Cayley, who remained in England. He stayed on Sutter's farm in Borkham Hills for a few weeks, but then departed into the bush. Though sadly, George Cayley and Daniel Mawatton did not part on good terms, together they had achieved much. A collection of over 700 animal specimens, being mainly birds, but with many previously unknown to Western science, the first preserved examples of many Australian plant species, including pioneering work on orchids and eucalypts, exploration and mapping of parts of the Sydney Basin, recording Darig names and knowledge of many plants and animals. Their significant cross-cultural scientific partnership would not be rivaled for over 200 years. Though now, of course, scientists regularly seek Aboriginal cultural knowledge in areas as diverse as archaeology, biology and land management practices. <laughs>